Okay, we're recording. So great. Yeah, just keep going on. If you want to start over on an answer, you can do that. You know, of course, you know, we'll be editing and things. So, um, so can you define this performance based orientation that you've been talking about for years? Yes, my definition, and I probably came up with this definition, maybe only 10 years ago, and I've been in the business 41 years. Uh, a performance competence is the phrase that I kind of hang on. And I use the word competence to honor the late Tom Gilbert and his book, Human Competence, which came out in 1978, a year before I got into the business. And performance competence is the ability to perform tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. And there are stakeholder requirements for the process itself and for the outputs. And, you know, the uh, regulatory agencies concerned with child labor laws, and that's the process. And your downstream customer, they're, they're uh, concerned with the output, the product of the process that you have shipped to them. And so there's all these stakeholders, there's the governments, there's management, there's employees, suppliers, customers, lots of them. And we need to understand what are their requirements to see if we're going to meet them or not. Not that we have to meet every last one. And of course, sometimes they're going to be in conflict. But the situation is very complex in that our customers have stakeholders and every stakeholder has stakeholders. So understanding what are all the requirements and how to win in a competitive situation where you're competing on price and scheduled delivery and quality of the product and all of that, it's, it just behooves us to be able to go in and focus on what are the performance requirements? Because if we're in the instruction or training or learning and development business, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to be able to individually or in teams, you know, perform tasks to produce outputs, what Gilbert called worthy outputs. Um, and they have to meet the stakeholder requirements, which he called accomplishments. That's what makes an output worthy is that it meets those requirements. So tell me a little bit about what you've been doing over the, the last eight months here. Well, I uh, took some time off here in the uh, in 2020, the year of the pandemic, to write a book. It's my 15th book. It's conducting performance-based instructional analysis. And the premise of the book is that uh, in order to avoid analysis paralysis by doing all of your analysis in one time, so to speak, uh, and going deep on it, you need to spread out your analysis efforts across the entire instructional development process. Now, I use an adapted ADDIE model, and on the front end, I've got project planning and kickoff. So when I'm doing the intake process and when I'm doing the, de uh, the development of a project plan, uh, to sell to my clients, and as a consultant, I'm selling it for you know, time <laughs> for money. And if I'm an internal consultant, you know, I have to get approval for spending the resources to do that. But so that whole front end is important, and we're doing analysis in that. That leads to phase two in my model analysis, where I'm doing four types: target audience, performance and gaps, enabling knowledge and skills, and then assessments of existing content. So I'm trying to reuse content either as is or after modification to shorten the development cycle and the cost to do all of that. Then I go into a design phase, phase three, uh, taking the analysis data and architecting instructional content, either learning and development, training and development paths, training and development events, training and development lessons, and my uh, last level of design instructional activities, information, demonstration, application. Uh, then we go into development and create you know, alpha content, first develop drafts, second drafts, beta, getting ready for pilot test. So there's a pilot test version. Then we go into a formal phase of pilot testing to do a full destructive test. And we get analysis data back through all of this. And then finally, we can do a revision and then release it to the deployment or access systems that our uh, clients have in place uh, so that people can take advantage of the instruction. So, but it's spreading out that analysis and rather than the, uh, there's an old saw from the quality movement you know, boiling the ocean for a cup of tea. Too often analysis gets bogged down in all of that because people, you know, are given one opportunity to go do it. And so they do it and they go deep and it takes them forever. Uh, and as a client of mine at Motorola back in 1981 said to me, <clears throat> when I, when I, in response to their request for training, they, I said, okay, here's what we're going to do in analysis. And he stopped me. He said, guy, we hate it when people like you come back 90 days later and tell us 
what we told you on day one. And I had to scramble and, and start doing the analysis right there in front of them and asking them questions. And eventually I exhausted their knowledge of the situation that they wanted me to target on their behalf. Uh, they were executives at Motorola, manufacturing operations managers. They'd been the target audience, you know, 15, 20 years earlier, but they didn't know what was going on today. And so they couldn't tell me. And so when I started asking them the kinds of questions that I needed answers to, they realized that, okay, yeah, he needs that. Okay, so we're going to go let him do that. Um, and then I had to make sure that I got back sooner than 90 days and that I had to really add value with what I brought them back, new insights for them. Um, but anyway, so, that's what the book was all about. That's yeah. So, time on. so tell me um, in, this, in, the, in your space of performance orientation, how has the pandemic changed anything and how do you see the fact that we've been communicating this way through zoom and well how do you see at post pandemic well i you know so when things get back to some sort of normal whatever that might be i think we'll still be using digital technologies for distributing content i think it's been a mistake i understand why the mistake was made but i think the rush the mad rush to convert our face-to-face -face classroom training into virtual uh, courses, uh, webinars, whatever you want to call them. I think that was a mistake. Uh, most original instruction in classroom training was a mistake anyway. Probably could have been handled with a simple standalone job aid or perhaps a job aid uh, taught you know, how to use it in a training session. But we should reserve classroom training for practice with feedback where we really want people to memorize something and have it at instant recall when the uh, when it's on demand in the in the performance context and most jobs don't have that you have time to go look things up. Um, and so we need to reserve that kind of uh, classroom training virtual or face to face for those needs. Where there truly are, where people have to memorize, you know, they have to have those knowledge and skills memorized and at the ready for instant recall and use. Um, otherwise, we could save our clients a lot of time and money, add more value, because asking me, expecting me to memorize, you know, the annual inventory procedure when we do it once a year is impossible. You give me a job aid, what Rumbler and Gilbert back in the 60s called guidance, and Joe Harless called it, and others called it job aids. And, or Gary called it electronic performance support systems. Now we're into performance support and workflow learning, you know, pretty much all the same kind of a thing. Um, yeah. We can, need can, more of that than, yeah. and not give everybody this instruction. Can I stop? I want to move to the workflow learning. Um, is that, it, that's a new term to me. Can you, can you explain what workflow learning is? Well, it's got... <laughs> It's like many of the terms in our business, uh, it has very many meanings to different people. So workflow learning is generally learning in the workflow, um, using resources, maybe I go get a YouTube video and that gives me enough guidance to do something or I get something that's specifically engineered for my job performance in my situation, uh, a formal job aid or performance support. So workflow learning, it, you know, so again, not everybody's gonna agree with this, but it's learning in the workflow but, but my take on that is that if I use a job aid, I may not really learn it. I may not memorize it. I may just use it, get the job done and then go on. And the next time I have faced with that, I'll use that job aid. But if it's something in my performance context that I'm gonna be doing every day, all day long, like if I'm a cash register you know, operator and I need to look up how to handle certain transactions because I don't do them all the time, when I start, eventually I'm gonna not need that job aid. I'm gonna have memorized what I need to know in order to be able to do that. So the, the resource, instead of a course, it can be used as a crutch to help me learn over time, or it can be that my guidance that I need and that I don't need to learn or memorize anything other than how to find that when I need it so I can use it and that will guide me in doing my job. So tell me a little bit about, um... You, I'm going to go, I'm kind of go, I want to go back to this idea of using the class, the in-person classroom correctly. So for, let's start out though, by talking about, um, you know, using the internet to learn um, that first part of, you know, just give me the sequence uh, in terms of when do we use internet and what is this, your strongest recommendation for using the classroom? 
Well, I think when we use, you know, so we can use the classroom virtually or face to face. So I think that's different. So sometimes we want people to get together socially, meet each other, get to know each other, you know, so that they can forgive each other for full pause later on, you know, during the performance cycle afterwards. So when we know each other, we're, we're a little bit more forgiving. Oh, that's just guy. He's just like that. He's snarky, but he doesn't mean anything by it. Um, or we can do that virtually and that just makes us, you know, we're at distance learning. We're not there. We don't pick up on all the little nuances, the little, uh, you know, behavioral cues that we could pick up. Um, so whether we use face-to-face -face or, or some digital means depends on, you know, what's the cost for doing that? What's the cost to fly everybody together versus the cost of just getting them into some Zoom or some, some room uh, digitally where they can uh, learn? So, but a lot of things have to do with what's the practice and feedback going to be? So, you know, can we teach welding virtually? Well, yeah, I think we can. But, it, you know, so there's a cost trade-off that we need to look at in terms of is it better to bring everybody into the welding class or can we teach it virtually and have them practice and get feedback on their welds virtually? What's the feasibility of that? Or do we do some sort of a blend where a guy learns about it virtually and then demonstrates what he's doing in front of the classroom uh, to the class virtually. But then a local supervisor comes along and checks the well to make sure that it passes uh, muster. So uh, there's no easy answers for that. And a lot of it depends on what's the infrastructure that an organization has in place to do all of this. What's, so cost is part of it. Uh, effectiveness is, of course, I think key. Efficiency comes after effectiveness in my mind. You know, So I want to be as effective as I possibly can be. If that makes me a little bit inefficient with using shareholder equity, then maybe that's what I've got to do to be effective with my instruction so that Guy, the learner, can go out and perform on the job and minimize errors, mistakes, et cetera. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Let's start, let's move to data real quickly. So the you know the internet um, and you know, computers obviously brought us data for many years now. Um, it seems to be really ubiquitous now. It's kind of a, a hot topic. Um, what do you feel is the best use of data? Well, I, so there's two sides of the data. Our customers have data about the performance, the business metrics. Our data, unfortunately in the learning development training world has been about activities you know butts and seats how long they're trained how many we trained and all those kinds of things now we're on butts and sites um and, but i think we need to look at what are our learning objectives and how do they tie to the performance objectives for people back on the job and how and how does that tie to the business metrics because if we're really truly successful with our instruction we should be impacting those business metrics and we shouldn't have to do a bunch of gymnastics to try to prove the learning data numbers somehow tie to goodness back on the job. I, I, I think we need to do a better job of understanding the business metrics of our clients, which are going to vary, and to see, you know, how can we impact that? What are the other variables that are going to impact those business metrics? And how can we tease out those other variables to see if we're being effective or not? I, I think that's the key. So, you know, big data, a lot of data and all that stuff, you know, the, the experts can extract a lot of things to help us in the instructional world do better. But I think we need to understand when we're training somebody to perform tasks to produce outputs, to stakeholder requirements, what are those requirements? Because those, those are the key data that we should be looking at. That's what we need to impact. Are we increasing yield of the process? Are we increasing the speed of the process to get some work done? And what's that turn into value? Now, if we can dollarize it, great. We can't dollarize everything, and so we shouldn't try. That's not the only way to look at how we impact performance, but it is a key one. You don't want to spend $100 and get $90 back every time because you do enough of that and you'll drive the company bankrupt. Right, that's right. So do you have any great, and what's your best story as it relates to data in terms of, I mean, have you been in, have you had a project where you, really were able to get at on the job performance data. In other words, you know, you, you set up everything right, you had your learning objectives, you had your, your um, what you wanted to accomplish, and then you were able to get the data as in terms of your impact on the job. Well, most clients are hesitant to give 
outsiders, an external consultant like me since 82, that data. Now I've, I've had testimonials from that. I did a project for Bank of America before all the changes. This was back in the late 90s and, uh, and we reduced uh, their turnover. I think it was 40%. I, I didn't even know this. Nine years after I did the project, the client writes a recommendation on LinkedIn for me, saying, quoting that number. It was a surprise to me. I had to call him up and ask him about it. But um, I, so I think that the, so I don't have a good answer for that. I can't tell you a story on that. But, but I did a project where, where we used a proxy for hard data. And this, I was working for a defense contractor and they were building composite parts that made stealth aircraft. Um, but one of their issues was they had draftsmen who had gone from the drafting boards, the tables on paper with blueprints and things like that to using CAD CAM systems, computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing systems, a brand new system. And there were about a hundred people in the target audience and they were, they were struggling mightily. The vendors training did not really get the job done for them. And so there was all sorts of errors. Um, they would you know, have errors in expensive tooling that made expensive parts that all failed final inspections. And so that I was in an, or I was, we had done a curriculum architecture design to figure out, you know, what are all the content that people that do this job need and how would you give that to them? What would be the training and development path be for them? And the price tag for putting in this training, none of it existed adequately. So it was, you know, new build for everything. It was about $2 million for this client. And the, the room exploded when I shared with them that number. My client was sitting in the room and they were, you know, anxious about all this. I said, well, you've got about 100 people here. What's the fully loaded cost of these people? What, what, what are their salary and the, the benefits and you know, their space and all of that? And they said about $60,000 a person. So I said, let's do the math. That's what you're paying for this performance right now. What level of proficiency are they at? Are they at 75%? No. 50? No. 25? No. And there was a big argument about that, but we stuck with 25, even though everybody in the room thought they were less proficient than 25%. I said, so what you're getting for your salary dollars, your fully loaded costs is 25% of that. So what's that delta right there? That's every year you're spending X and you're getting much less. You're only getting 25% at best. So if we could get them up to 75% proficiency, what would that be worth? And the numbers were were staggering and made the $2 million look like a pittance. And so my client got the funding to do that project. Now, did, did we get them up to 75%? The client would never tell me. That's all secret stuff and they're not gonna share that. Now, they weren't in a competitive situation, but their client, the US Air Force and the US Navy, they would be concerned about, you know, how what was the problem in the first place? How come it took so long to resolve these kinds of things? But, uh, but it was an interesting use, I think, of, of data and, and using a unique, unique approach. So this was all posed in quality terms, not instructional terms. It was all the cost of nonconformance. You know, what does it cost you to not be in conformance? That's the return in ROI. And what's the cost of conformance? What's it gonna take you to get to conformance? That's, that's the I in ROI, the investment. So I took the ROI concept and put it in quality terms and did the math in front of a room of about 30 people with their numbers that they gave me. And we just did the math. And then all of a sudden that $2 million was well worth it because they were gonna get that back in the first quarter once the training was all available. Right, right. Okay, so I promised I'd keep this short. So just- in, in, <laughs> You're talking in, to the wrong guy. <laughs> so anyway, just in wrapping up, Let's, uh, can you, any kind of terms come to mind? I, I really liked your, I, I like your discussion of the, you know, how we're going to use classrooms going forward. And uh, the, any kind of terms with that in terms of the, you know, the impact of the pandemic in terms of driving us online, right? Really kind of reinforcing that certain things can be done on the internet and, and probably leading us to a more split, approach than maybe we've done before in terms of how we're training people. So any any last comments on on the impact of the pandemic and what what you're going to call the new the new normal of really focusing on digital and using the classroom for maximum uh, efficiency. Well, I hope that 
again, we have a performance orientation. We understand the process, you know, back on the job for our learners, and that we're focused on that. And I think we should teach people in our courses how to use the resources that we've given them. Uh, and so we quit expecting people to memorize everything. So this whole notion of performance support and workflow learning, yeah, if the workflow, which to me is simply a new term for process. So a process orientation or a workflow orientation, I think is best. I, and, I'm, and I applaud that we're moving to that. I'm, I'm, I'm saddened by the fact that we've got to use so many dang conflicting words for the same thing here. And that causes confusion and makes it harder for people climbing the learning curve in our business. But whether you're process oriented or performance oriented or workflow oriented, I think it's all a good thing. So I hope that we do that. And that in our in our classrooms, virtual or face-to-face, -face, we quit expecting people to memorize everything. We need to give them the guidance for doing the job as authentically required back on the job. Excellent. Thank you so much, Guy, for your time today. I love that last one. That was great. So thank you so much. Good luck to you, John. Yeah, thanks. Bye-bye.